Okay, I think we can start now. Um, just to in introduce myself, my name is Stephen Freneman. I'm the product manager for antennas at Pointing Group. I'd firstly like to welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions during the presentation. Uh, we will try to answer some of your questions directly and also take some questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, presenting today, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Andre Ferri. Dr. Ferri is the chairman of uh, Pointing Group. Andre is also a specialist and innovator on this topic. Over to you, Andre. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, well, firstly, welcome to everyone. We're actually quite surprised and excited to get such a number of people attending the webinar. I'm going to switch on the webcam, um, but I'm actually only going to do it for a short while, just so that you see that you've actually got the real guy speaking to you, um, and go through the agenda, and then I'm going to switch off again. Um, okay, let me just get my own image out of the agenda. Um, the real, the last sentence really what uh, caused us to give this, why pay for reputable well-designed antennas? We get this question a lot, and I think the whole thing starts with understanding the properties of antennas, the applications. In other words, antennas have got a lot more in them than what is apparent from a typical um, spec sheet. So it's really interpreting those spec sheets and watching out for some of the misleading and sometimes purely false type of claims people can put in a spreadsheet. I'm going to switch off the webcam now. And let's get into the meat of it. Okay, the most important part is really this drawing in front of you. This illustrates the frequency band used for cellular and of course a bit of Wi-Fi here. But what happened is right when we started cellular, it was mainly in the GSM 900 band. Then we got the 17, 1800 band, got the UMTS bands, 4G, and then people started using more and more bands. So you can see that we're using LTE 4G up to about 3.8 gigahertz. And recently, there's the digital dividend bands. And there's even a band at 450 megahertz that people are starting to use. Now, this band is really the reason why antenna design got very challenging. We don't mind. I think we've got excellent antenna designers on board. But to cover all of this band in a reasonable fashion, or whatever part of the band that you're promising to cover, is actually quite challenging. Antenna-wise, anyone that understands antennas will know that it's not at all an easy matter. So let's start off just um, sort of taking everyone through the sort of main types of antennas that you get. Um, the, the most common one, I would say, is the um, Yagi or Yagi Uda antenna, typically used for television. But lo and behold, we actually do find people using them for cellular. Now, of course, they are very narrow band, so it used to work okay when you only got the 900 megahertz band or only a narrow band, but really not desirable. People call this guy, the lock periodic dipole array, a Yagi, but it isn't a Yagi. This guy's got very long elements on the one end, and much sh um, shorter ones in the front, and it's actually got a feed line linking them. This guy can actually cover any band that you design it for, and that's an excellent, although a bit big, but an excellent antenna, giving you high gain over the whole bandwidth, or whichever bandwidth you design it for. Omnis is the most interesting. What you see here is effectively a high gain Omni. Now, high gain and Omni seem to be um, uh, contradictory in terms, but you can actually increase the gain of an Omni, and I'll explain what's important in these. Just to note that there's very few people, honestly, worldwide that can design these type of antennas to cover a wide frequency band. Extremely difficult to get an uh, omni antenna to, uh, to have both gain and cover a wide bandwidth. Panel antennas, very common. Um, th these typically have got a directional beam, and the beam gain is proportional to the area of the, or the size of the panel. It's very important. Uh, if people are interested, we can actually give you equations that tell you what's the maximum gain you can get out of a specific size. And we often see specifications claiming gains that's clearly impossible in terms of the size of the antenna. We've got small antennas. We call it a puck. It refers to an ice hockey puck. Small enclosure, really designed for on vehicles, on devices, uh, machines, instruments, and so forth. And clearly, that antenna, you don't want or you cannot actually get high gain out of it. And you want it just to radiate satisfactorily at all the frequencies. And remember this thing about all frequencies and in all directions. And I'll discuss both of those. MIMO, I'll explain in more detail. But these are, we're using two antennas for 2x2 two two MIMO. 
very soon we'll use 4x4 MEMA and so forth, but mainly it's 2x2 MEMA at the moment. So it's two antennas sometimes in one enclosure, and you can also use two separate antennas. But if you use 2x2 MEMA, you can effectively double your data rate if they are so-called decorrelated, and I'll explain it a bit better later. Helical antennas, these are directional, mainly used in mines and tunnels. Excellent propagation because they're circularly polarized. And uh, we've got reflector antennas, which one commonly see, but not often used for the whole cellular bands, quite often used in Wi-Fi communication. The picture here is one of the ones I truly love. Um, this is really starting to look at radiation patterns. And most of the antenna parameters relate to radiation pattern. Now, the first thing to note is that, that the radiation pattern is a three-dimensional thing. In other words, what this is representing, the distance from the middle represents the intensity of radiation. And this antenna would be radiating in this direction here. And in this case, it's also represented by color. So you can see the maximum band is in front. Um, but then what people typically do on spec sheets, they would cut it this way, and that would be called the elevation cut. And the elevation cut would be a side view. I prefer side view. I think people can relate to a side view of the antenna. And the other cut is this one that you see here. And that's really the radiation pattern in azimuth. But always do remember that those are just two slices out of a three-dimensional bubble which describes how an antenna focuses a beam, and that's what gives it gain in specific directions. So if you now look at those 2D images, the, the one would be the top view, the one would be the side view. Um, the next sort of parameter that one often sees, and it's an important one, is the beam width. Now, antenna has not got like a beam. It's got a certain width, and then it disappears. What people refer to as a beam width is the point at which the tower drops that's the peak power, peak focused power. It drops here to half of its power, and half is also known as minus 3 dB. So it's the 3 dB beam width, also the half power beam width. Note that beam width is this complete arc. Um, in other words, it's not plus minus the beam width. The beam width is the complete arc that's covered. Also note that the gain is not maintained over that beam width. You're going to get the main gain, the P gain in the pattern, and up down to minus 3 dB. So if you're planning links um, that have to cover a number of sort of uh, different angles, uh, do keep that into account. OK. Um, this, again, is, I think, one of the absolute crux type of slides to show. Uh, we're going to look at how does beam width influence gain. Once again, there's actually nice equations, which I don't want to bother with here. But if anyone is interested, there's fundamental limits in terms of how beam width and gain relates to each other. So when someone tells you the beam width of an antenna, you can actually sort of tell fundamentally what would be the maximum gain that could be obtained from that beam width. But in general, if you look at omni antennas, you could have a low gain, medium gain, or high gain omni. That would be quite a high gain omni. And if you look at the azimuth, once again, that's looking from the top. What you want from an omni, of course, is that it radiates equally well in all directions. Now, that's not at all obvious, especially if you're trying to do this over a wide frequency band. If you go to medium gain, you can see that the circle increases, so there's more gain going towards the sides, because we're looking from the top. And if we look at these side views, it really becomes clear why this happens. In other words, if you look at the low gain guy, the reason why we got a little bit more gain in the isotrap, by the way, isotrap is something that radiates equally in absolutely all directions. But here you can see we started squashing an isotrope. It's like a balloon that you take and you squash it in the middle, and you can see we can make it increase towards the sides. So we can get gain um, while we've still got an omnidirectional. Never the same gain as what you can get out of a directional antenna, but we can squash it some more, and that will happen. And if we squash it some more, you can get high gain. What you just have to note is that getting this gain is not for free. In other words, you're getting less and less radiation at other angles, okay, in order to get a lot in this direction. So the higher the gain of omni antenna, the more careful you have to be in terms of erecting it. In other words, if this thing is slightly skewed, it could be pointing towards the ground and not give you the actual gain in the direction you're pointing. If you're on a hilly terrain and something like that, the same could happen. And of course, if you're on a yacht or something that tilts, you would rather like this or perhaps this, and that could give you better performance. Directional pretty similar, 
Except the difference here is that we are squishing the balloon in all directions. In other words, if you look at the top view, it's pointing or protruding or bulging in one direction, and the bottom view is the same. If you go to say a 9 dBi antenna, that's about close to nine times um, the power that you would get out of isotrope, you can see that it gets narrower. And if you go to 14 dBi, you can see that this beam also gets narrower. So it also gets a little bit more difficult to align, or you have to do it more careful at the high gain. And if you go to vicious, for example, it could get very sharp. Um, and the medium and low gain, low gain you would often use if you actually want to give coverage, like in a Wi-Fi hotspot, if you put it in one corner of a warehouse, you can use this type of gain and you get almost 90 degrees coverage, which is actually a lot better than your typical Omni would give you. Just going over to the next slide. Very nice. So we've talked now of static radiation patterns. In other words, we've talked about radiation patterns, which varies in terms of the angle. But the real killer is what you just saw. In other words, as you change frequency, the radiation pattern, this whole 3D block, also convolve and morphs into different shapes. And this is perhaps one of the most difficult things because gain is specified in the IEEE standards as the peak of the radiation at some angle. Now, of course, this is a nice technical spec, but we would actually like the thing to radiate where we want it to, not specifically just in one uh, at the direction of the maximum. But what the IEEE does not define is if you've got an antenna operating over a frequency band that starts at say 2.1 and goes to 2.5, the gain also varies over this frequency band. In other words, most people will quote you that gain. Okay, they, and I think legitimately can choose the peak and, and we all love to do that. But unless they give you the full curve, we also quote the peak by the way, but we do tend to give you almost with every product the gain over the frequency band. And from that, you can see that you often have very big variations from that peak gain. So once I get a bit of specmanship, and I'll show you an example of how this could confuse um, people to no end. If you look at the next um, drawing, it gives you an example of what we've often seen. Um, here you can see an antenna that's designed to cover this band. That would be, say, 1700 to 2.2. That could be 900. And you can see that this antenna here could have a very low gain, could heat up to say ADBI there, and it could go lower again. Now, a manufacturer or reseller could legitimately claim this is an ADBI antenna. Um, and this band, you can see the same could be happening. And lo and behold, you could even find that out of band, you've got this point here. Now, once again, technically, correctly, you can quote this as the gain of the antenna, but clearly, absolutely useless to the user wants to know the gain in the bands that he would like to use it. This antenna here would have the same spec. In other words, it would have an ADVI spec. But I think for everyone, it's absolutely clear that this is tons better than this and tons more reliable. Because one of the additional problems, people would do field measurements. They'll measure and they say, oh, but your antenna does the same as some other antenna that's perhaps just a low cost antenna designed in some mass produced um, factory. And it could be that you're sitting there, in which case you will get the same. But your customer, because the frequencies are different across countries, networks, and so forth, could be sitting at another point. So what you measured, convince yourself it's actually equal to a pretty well-designed antenna, um, could not at all be true. They could obviously also go operate here, where the antenna may overall be worse in terms of performance. Performance, by the way, is always most difficult to obtain at the lowest frequencies because the wavelength there changes rapidly. If we now look at the problems. Um, so the one problem you can see is the variations in frequency, but the other problems is the variations in direction. So here you've got, for example, a directional antenna, or two directional antennas, and you can see they're the directional, they're pointing in this direction, that's where you would like to talk to, your base station, the other side of your link is in that direction. Now we've honestly seen this, where antenna would have this type of performance. In other words, it will have a null in this direction that you wish to talk to. Now it may seem like I'm exaggerating or talking nonsense, because why would anyone design this quite close to disaster of an antenna? But what often happens is it's not like they designed this. The antenna may have done this at some frequency, and then at some later frequency it splits apart that morphing ball that you saw, and this happens and it gets back together again, 
But the one thing that's really amazing and once again legitimate is people will quit that game at this frequency where it actually became useless. And once again, technically speaking, they are correct. That is the maximum of the pattern. But to you as a user, that is absolutely, absolutely useless. So you really need to know that people design something to do what you would expect it to do. Um, or of course, test it to a lot of detail, but that's difficult. A, a nice Omni would do this. In other words, you want it to radiate maximum towards the horizon. It will be a lower gain guy, but still the same thing. And you would like it to be sort of omnidirectional, circular in all directions. And once again, you quite often find this type of behavior, especially on very small Omnis that should be doing this, where it's actually lobing. In other words, it's varying both in terms of its omnidirectionality and in terms of its elevation pattern. Now, one of those funny things that I told you about in tennis is that an isotrope has been distorted. This guy would be, they would be able to quote higher gain for this antenna, this disastrous antenna, than what I ever can quote for this antenna. Because physics dictate that if I wanted to radiate in all directions, it will have lower gain than this guy, because this guy's got sort of hot spots in these directions. And I would actually quote you these hot spots, even though they are obscure directions that you would never want to talk to. So, and once again, these things vary with frequency. So I have even see where a guy would choose this point, next frequency, the lobes will be in a different point, they'll choose that point. Clearly absolute nonsense, even though it is technically correct. This is, I suppose, a picture of the same scenario, just showing it in a real life um, type of situation. So that same sort of nasty pattern, and remember this nastiness varies with frequency. Now you can see that you've both got a problem in terms of talking in all directions. In other words, depending on which way this car is pointing, you may have radiation going that direction, you may not. But even worse, if you look at the elevation, you could have much of the radiation going upwards, for example, or downwards. In both directions, not useful for your communication. But people will quote you these things here as the gain of the antenna. And of course, because it varies with frequencies, that point there that currently is at this frequency, the peak for that specific antenna could be at that. And once again, nonsense. You need to have, you need to know what's happening in the direction you're going to use it for. So of course, this would be the ideal case, where it is actually omnidirectional and, and all uh, all sides. Never possible with the actual vehicle. The vehicle will change it, but you want it as good as you can get it. And of course, where the maximum is towards the horizon, not towards Mars. Pluto or the moon. Okay, and that covers sort of, I think, the most important parts. In other words, gain varying with frequency, pattern varying with frequency, and gain being defined in this foggy fashion, which can almost make people print anything they want on a spec sheet. If we look at polarization, polarization has got to do with the direction in which the E field vector varies, because we all know that the radio wave is actually an electromagnetic wave. It's got an electric field and a magnetic field. It's the finest direction of the magnetic field. It's also normally, if you can see elements or it's a vertical like this, normally in the direction of the longest part of the antenna. And this would be horizontal, that would be vertical. The most important part about it is to know that if you're talking horizontal, you have to have a horizontally polarized antenna at the other side. If you try to talk horizontal to vertical, you virtually get no signal. Okay, so it's very important to have aligned polarization. This is a circularly polarized antenna, the helix, the helical that we use in tunnels. Very good for propagation uh, underground because there's a lot of reflections. There the vector rotates. It's quite useful if you don't know what is the direction of your receiver, for example, a, a mobile or handheld. Um, but you pay a price of you lose half the power if you take linear to circular. So those give you polarization. In a sense, nothing to do with the pattern. It's a separate characteristic of the radio wave. The most interesting one is, of course, um, now for MIMO, the most successful way of getting two deep correlated signals. In other words, having two antennas in one enclosure and getting your full, say, two by two doubling of speed is to transmit one horizontal and one vertical. Well, it doesn't matter if it's horizontal and vertical. It could be plus or minus 45. And just for interest, even if the base station uses plus or minus 45 and use, use 0 and 90, MIMO um, electronics will actually sort it out. You'll still get your full um, decorrelation and uh, doubling of data rates that you would expect.
now we get to choice of antennas. I think, and we took a long time to get to this nice little chart. This is just a bit of an advert for a chart that we've created. Yes, that same frequency band diagram that I showed you at first, but trying to make it easier for people to select antennas. In other words, these would be low gain omni type of antennas. And here you would be able to see, for example, if you take this line through, that would be the frequency range covered by this guy here. So you can first select what type of antenna you want and then sort of look at which one covers the correct frequency band for you. And of course you need to have some assurance that this is actually going to happen. And in spec sheets you can go look at detailed gains do vary across the bands, but um, we fully disclose the, the gain um, at each part of the frequency band. This would be medium gain omnis, or actually highest that you can get at cellular. Um, and you can see the same thing applies. In other words, some omnis go over a wide frequency range. That's our most impressive one, since it covers both the 450 megahertz band all the way up to 2.7. And it does that all the time, maintaining a beam going towards the horizon. And extremely difficult. I've measured many, many antennas that would claim this band, the VSWR will be good over this band. And VSWR I'm not going to discuss, it's not actually important, but the antenna pattern is not maintained over the whole band. Here you can see the same for um, cross polarized antennas. In other words, where you've got two antennas per this enclosure, of course, must use that for 4G LTE if you do want to get that MIMO benefit. And the same you can get here for um, Wi Fi antennas, block periodics, and so forth. So you can choose the type of antenna, these are directional ones, and then see which ones cover the band you would like to cover. Now, the impact of um, outdoor antennas, it's effectively the impact of outdoor antennas on data rate is dramatic. Um, I got this from a source, but um, I can tell you that we've actually found it much larger variations. In other words, this would be an indoor case where you've got indoor antennas. The moment you move outdoors, you get a massive increase in the data rates. The reason why data rates increase um, so fast uh, is nowadays people use modulation techniques which can use a very simplistic scheme when it signals to noise is, is bad. It can then up, go up to say um, quadrature 16, um, 64, QAM and so forth. So it can use much more complex where you can do much more bits per symbol. And that is the reason why you find this sort of very fast gradient. The gradient is most significant. You can see this is distance from tower where the signal is of course weak because there it would be at its lowest rate and you could find increases, and we've certainly seen increases of 10 to 30 times in data rate. Um, I must note, of course, gain is important, but the most important part is actually going from inside a house to outside a house. You get virtually 16 to 25 dB gain just taking um, an antenna outdoors. What's MIMO? And um, of course, this is a part we love because antennas are integral to getting MIMO advantages. MIMO was introduced. Um, with 4G LTE and with the latest Wi-Fi standards. If we just look at 2x2 two two MIMA, there's two ways you can get it. Um, you could have a base station, sorry my, my laser point is just a bit slow, um, which transmits from two antennas and you could then have the boat also having two antennas on and by transmitting over there MIMA would try to find two decorrelated paths, so it will try to find a way of getting two data streams because those antennas are somewhat decorrelated, being far apart. Typically, the further apart, the better. Um, that's certainly going to be important when we're doing 4x4 four four MIMO. But I would say, when you're doing 2x2 two two MIMO, by far the sim simpler technique, and it gives fantastic results, is to use cross-polarized antennas. In other words, to use two polarizations, because there you are certain that you're going to get that doubling of the data rate. Um, and you're certain you're getting, going to get it regardless of reflections and so forth, um, which you almost rely on in the case we're using two spaced antennas. But you can use spaced antennas and it's often required if you're going to use two omnis, because omnis, we, well, it's very difficult on an omni to get both horizontally and a vertically polarized uh, omni antenna. Okay, this slide um, is perhaps in terms of um, the, the topic that I've addressed. In other words, why do you want to make sure that you buy from a reputable sort of supplier? 
And this is certainly the part where it's crucial. If you look at environmental considerations, wind, antennas, we rate typically antennas up to 160 kilometers an hour. Many people will write that on a spec sheet. They will just write that's the wind rating of the antenna. Um, we typically test antennas to this um, wind speed. Where we test them, because um, uh, tunnels, wind tunnels at this um, type of speed is very difficult to get, but the way we test them is that we um, use a vehicle, a special track, go at that speed, antenna sideways, and I think that's an extremely real test. But in all cases, our um, antennas are tested up to that specification. If you look at salt and corrosion, um, this is uh, salt spray chambers and so forth. We test everything and every component that goes into it, and piece of stainless steel, because these are the things that you only notice later. You, when you see an antenna, you can't tell that it's got these problems. And a year later, you may have it blowing down in the wind, um, or in this case, icing up. We test all of the antennas in an actual fridge down to the um, uh, low temperature specification. We give it. We test it in ovens in terms of the high specification. We do additional tests where we use rain. We've got a little rain machine, which is just a complex shower, because antennas, even though this doesn't relate to the IP rating, uh, just having rain on them sometimes change their performance. So we test them in rain conditions uh, while measuring the performance. UV, this is another thing. It's a very expensive compound. You have to add plastics to ensure that it's UV protected. Now, of course, you can't really check that without very complex equipment. And if it doesn't have UV protection, you find two years down the line, you can just knock on a radar and it will shatter. In other words, it goes completely brittle. But you have to virtually trust a manufacturer that is ensured that it's um, suitably UV protected. High quality, I think, goes without any um, saying. And I think for people in Europe, um, the regulation on hazardous substances, many people just say this is rose compliant. We, once again, have got a full X-ray spectrograph where we test every component going into our products to make sure that it complies. And this is important because ultimately when something would fail or would be caught out that it's actually not rose compliant, and there's often a lot of people in trouble for that. In other words, every part of the chain has to ensure that things that they sell are rose compliant. So, after quite a bit of talking, Perhaps we can look at this slide um, and just see what is sort of the issues in terms of just buying an antenna based perhaps on price and specifications that seem to be the same. I think one of the problems, and I've highlighted some of these, is that the testing complexity means that a customer or reseller um, have difficulty in assessing all of the things that sits on a specification sheet. And as I've explained, a lot of them could be misleading, could be false, etc. So in a sense, there has to be a trust that you have to rely on the manufacturer's design and specifications. Um, of course, all of this, especially the ones that happen down the line, year or two, affects reseller reputation, whoever product supplier. Um, if things start falling apart later, people are not going to say, oh, we're sorry that you didn't see that. They're going to be entirely unhappy about it. Um, and I think I tried to highlight some of this, but antennas should be designed addressing all of the functional imperatives which the user don't even know about. What I'm really trying to say, you, you want these little things that I've pointed out in some of the earlier slides to be addressed by the designers because they need to understand what these things are going to be used for. And if they interact closely with customers, we find much of what we put into our designs have been put in because of cooperation with our customers, but often you virtually can't even put it on a spec sheet or it doesn't make the specification look better. It just means that many of those hidden pitfalls are avoided and in a sense you can trust that the things have been designed to do what they're designed to be, uh, to, uh, to be used for. Um, environmental aspects I think I've said and I think you can see that those perhaps are the most difficult in terms of testing complexity and once again you have to rely that these things are properly tested and incorporated in every design. Now, um, that's perhaps the fun comic. If you look at the other side of the story, if you look at the value proposition, antenna is really the thing that radiates waves and receives waves for your modem or for any type of uh, wireless connection. 
So it's like a speaker, in my opinion, that's my best analogy, an audio system. It's typically not the most expensive part, but it's certainly the most critical part in making sure that your wireless connection happens, and your wireless connection could obviously be part of a much larger system. So firstly, often the electronics is already more expensive, but if this thing is earning you income, like a credit card machine, or it's protecting some valuable equipment, then one could see that it becomes almost nonsensical to go save money on the most critical part of the system, um, whereas its actual cost or the cost associated with it failing is often extremely high. Uh, we know that even installation alone often exceeds antenna price. But this guy here, hopefully with happy customers going through quickly, the guy that uses the antenna here may be charging for the transactions, in which case he's losing out very badly um, if these things don't work, and very often customers will just change supplier. They won't even complain about it. Thanks very much to everyone. I'm not sure if Stephen wants to come in and perhaps we can discuss some of the questions or queries that's occurred from people. Yes, thank you very much, Andre. Um, it looks like we did not have too many questions, probably because you did quite a good job there. <laughs> thank you. Um, However, there were a few questions. Um, the f uh, something that came up quite a lot was to send the presentation to everybody. Yes, of course, we will do that. So uh, we'll just um, send out the uh, presentation afterwards to, to everybody. Um, another question that came up was, um, what are good radiation angles uh, required for vehicle communication? So I think that came from the slide where the police car in. Andre, if you, yes. can, if you can answer that. Just to um, talk people through that, um, if you've got a, a vehicle, typically you do want a fairly broad pattern, in other words, towards the horizon. Um, clearly, all the communications you can do is essentially towards the horizon. Now, people say to me, what about a tall building or a tower? Um, what I always say to them, when that vehicle is close to the tower, you almost don't need an antenna. The moment you're about a kilometer away, say, you find that even a tall tower is at about two or three degrees away from the horizon. So you want radiation towards the horizon, and you want it to vary as little as possible um, as you walk around the, the vehicle. Like I said, vehicles specifically are quite difficult because the vehicle itself influences that pattern. But you at least want the antenna to start off being able to cover all directions, and perhaps you will have a bit of a jiggles and waffles as it goes around, and that one do have to live with, but if the antenna starts off not being omnidirectional, of course there's no chance of achieving that. Okay, thank you, Andre. Another question that came up was um, regarding the slide where you said you can uh, improve data rates through uh, mounting of an antenna externally. Maybe you can just give a little bit more practical examples of that. Why is that? And how would you what uh, how would you mount your antennas? What would you look at? Uh, would you look at a, a omni antenna, directional antenna, and so on? If if you look at um, and and I'm mainly at the moment talking um, to people wanting to say getting a fixed internet connection, where the the data rate and so forth is important. Um, we've um, we do installations in South Africa of, of cellular antennas at various frequencies for operators. So we've installed about five to 6,000, and we've got an online portal where the installer reports each time the signal that he received indoors at the modem, and then what that signal is after he's installed the antenna. That's where that figure that I gave you of about 16 to 25 dBi comes from. Um, that plus the gain, in other words, the first gain that you get when you go outdoors, and it's difficult to explain, but indoors you've got a multi-part situation, so you've got a lot of variation in signals. So it's firstly very uh, unreliable. I think everyone that may have used TVs years and years ago and you had the little bunny ears, remember that as you walk around in the room, the picture will fluctuate. The same happens at Wi-Fi. So with the signal fluctuating, and you're never sure whether your antenna is in the right spot, and typically the signal is much weaker, the signal to noise and the speed that it can connect at. Of course, the signal also need to penetrate the walls and so forth. So going outdoors is the biggest gain. And uh, then, of course, you can go omni. That's why I often recommend people going omni. Because if you go outdoors with the omni, that of course operates at all of the frequencies, you don't have to align it. Okay, So you can just put it up. 
and you actually get the largest part of that gain. In other words, you're going to get with an Omni about 16 to 20 dB gain. But of course, if you really are in a weak signal area, or it's a critical link, then you can use a directional antenna and should use a directional antenna. So many of the people using antennas are really on fringes of coverage and so forth. And there the directional antennas um, make a lot of sense. Okay, thank you, Andre. I think that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, if I, I did see another question or two come through, I'll definitely make sure those uh, questions are answered directly with each individual, uh, either via email or we'll get in contact with you in some or other way. Um, and yes, thank you everybody for joining and uh, please stay online after we end the session just to answer a quick survey. And please feel free to us, even after this, send us an email. You've got the details uh, on the screen at the moment. Info at pointing.tech is our email address. And uh, you're also very welcome to uh, visit our webpage as you see there. So Sorry, Stephen, no, just, uh, just the last yes, comment yeah. from myself um, is that uh, we had to, unfortunately, because uh, not everyone's got all that much time, um, cover a lot of topics here pretty fast. but. Um, there is a pointing channel on YouTube where most of the topics like gain of antennas, memos and so forth are covered in little two-minute videos. So anyone interested, um, that's I think quite a useful resource. And perhaps Stephen can also just send people links to these um, videos should they want to have a, a bit of a more elaborate explanation on many of the topics um, covered today. Good, thank you. Thank you everybody. As I said, just stay online for the quick survey and thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate and just email us with any questions you should have. Thank you and bye-bye.